time of year when we can remember the longing for you to come, Jesus, and then as we celebrate your birth, the plan put into force by our God, our creator, to bring us home to you. And as we stand before you as sons and daughters of God, as saved and redeemed people from Jesus Christ, our Savior, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have given us understanding and joyfulness and purpose of life here in your presence. May your name be known. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me.
fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. And from David in Psalms. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Yeah. 
during this time of communion, I'd like us to think about and meditate on seeing and worshiping of the, the risen Lord Jesus. As we read through the Gospel of Matthew, we can easily find at least four times where people approached Jesus and worshiped him. The first encounter occurred in Bethlehem when the Magi visited the family. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. The Magi traveled a great distance to look for the child that had been promised, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. When they witnessed God's promise fulfilled, they opened the treasures that they believed were worthy of the Son of God. As followers of Christ, we follow the Magi's example and seek to worship Jesus. What they knew in part, we now fully understand, and we understand it more clearly. Jesus is God in the flesh. He deserves our worship. The second instance of people worshiping Jesus are described in Matthew chapter 14, verse 33. Now, this is after Peter was rescued when he began to sink and, and he had just walked on the water. Jesus helped Peter back into the boat with the other disciples and the wind ceased. The disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. The third time people worshipped Jesus was when he met the women who had just left the empty tomb. The women quickly, quickly ran from the tomb. They were frightened but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. And that's from Matthew 28, verses 8 and 9. The fourth worshipful encounter occurred on the mountain in Galilee after Jesus' resurrection. The scripture says... Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. When these eleven disciples met the resurrected Jesus, they abandoned themselves to worship the one they thought they had lost. The Magi found Jesus before his ministry began. The eleven disciples encountered him in Galilee after witnessing his authority for years. The Magi gave gifts to Jesus uh, of worship, and they left with overflowing joy. The apostles longed to be near Jesus, never having to face separation from him again. Jesus made a promise to those early disciples that he intended for every disciple at the time he made the prop, uh, promise and into the future, the future disciples. And in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20, he said, Jesus came and told the disciples, and be sure of this, I am with you always to the end of the age. We gather as believers in Jesus to worship him, to remember his death on the cross for our sins and, and his resurrection from the grave. As Christians, we don't leave Jesus in the manger, or we don't even leave him in this building when we leave this morning. This communion is not just a reminder of Jesus' death, but also to his last promise to all of his disciples. As we eat the bread and drink from the cup, we celebrate that Jesus remains faithful to all his followers and that he is always with us. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you're always being with us. Lord, we remember you on the cross. And, and your body and blood that you so willingly gave for our sins. You are worthy of our praise and worship. Lord, I ask you to be with us today and help us to always seek you and that we may not lose our focus, but to always keep our eyes on you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
this morning because we want to lift you up. Because we want to look back so many years ago to that Bethlehem stable and realize that you loved us so much that you came into this world as a little baby. That you faced all the trials and tests that we go through in life and you lived a perfect life only to lay it down on Calvary's cross to pay not for your sins but for ours. And then to rise three days later to show that eternal life can be ours if we put our trust in you. And for your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, and your love this morning, we praise you and we lift you up in this place. Father, we pray for those who aren't with us today, those who are traveling, those who are sick and afflicted and need your healing touch, that you would restore each one to us once more. Father, fill this place with your spirit so that we can feel you near today. Touch our hearts and our lives. Speak to us through your word that you, we might truly be your servants and you might be our God. And now we pray, Father, that everything that's done in this hour, every song we sing, every prayer we offer, every word we speak would be to your glory and yours alone. For we ask this all in the precious name of your only son, Jesus. Amen. The kids are dismissed to junior church uh, at this time. And as they're headed out, I want to tell you a story I heard uh, about a search firm in Chicago. And one of the headhunters there who, who was experienced with interviewing some of the most poised, some of the most powerful leaders in one of our nation's third largest cities. He, he had the task of cutting through the sophistication, the exterior, 
um, the outside and seeing how they reacted under pressure. So he, he said he would simply begin with some simple questions, where they'd worked before, what they'd done before, to, to kind of get them at ease. And then in the middle, he would lean across his desk and he would ask one question, one question that would cause them to stammer, stutter. He'd simply ask them, what is the purpose of life? Hmm. Isn't it amazing? The, the, the people, with all we know, we can't really tell you why we're alive. We know the mission statements are things that businesses have because it helps them to, to dedicate themselves in a certain direction. And we even have a mission statement as a church that, that we want to know God so that we can grow in God, so that we can go out and bring other people so that they can know God. And yet, while companies have mission statements that express their reason for existence, and in places like churches, we can't, we can't clearly define why we're here, what the purpose of our life is. What, what are you trying to accomplish in life? Where are you going? What, what is your life all about? If we can't answer that question, then we're probably never going to reach our full potential. We, we never experience real satisfaction. We may not even find eternal life. Zig Ziglar said, we cannot become wandering generalities. We have to have a meaningful specific in our life. J. Wallace Hamilton talks about a, a government program during the Great Depression that started out with optimism but ended in despair. See, the government went out and they hired a bunch of men to, to build a road. And they gave them picks and they gave them shovels and these guys were so thrilled to finally have a job, to finally be able to provide for their families that they went out and they worked with all diligence. But after a few days, they began to realize that the road that they were building was going nowhere. It simply went out into the wilderness and then was going to quit with no reason for it ever really existing. And it wasn't very long before their spirits began to decline, their productivity dropped, and, and many just get, quit and went home. And Hamilton concluded the story by saying this, roads to nowhere are hard to build. And that happens in our lives too. We, we want to get ahead, we want to pay the bills, we want to accumulate for the future, but, but, but then one day we realize that everything we're saving for and everything we're doing really re leads to, to nowhere. And, and so somewhere in those middle years, we begin to struggle with restlessness, depression, midlife crisis. Some people take off on tangents that are completely against their moral character. Some even commit suicide because the truth is in life that roads to nowhere are hard to build. But Jesus Christ came that first Christmas morning to give us an essential gift, to give us the gift of purpose. Through this last month, we've talked a little bit about the angels and the shepherds and and we read through the Christmas story together, and we're going to continue in that this morning as we see that God came that night with a very special gift. He wanted to give us a spiritual desire to follow him, a purpose for our life. And so I want you to look at this scripture with me today, and, and, and we're going to look at the scripture, and then we're going to apply it to our lives a little bit. And in the end, I think we're going to come up with a purpose in life that really can boil down to two words. And I'll let you think about that for a little while. The first thing I want you to notice is that, that, that they received God's revelation that night. In, in Luke chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, and the angel, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. 
And so they accepted that night that what the angels were saying were God's revelation to man. You know, human pride uh, makes us want to do everything on our own, doesn't it? That's why a little two-year-old will turn to his mom and say, let me do it myself. And many times in life, we want to reach God on our own abilities. And so brilliant people have studied all the religions in the world, and they, think, they say that, I think, you know, every religion has some good principles about it. But the problem is that man's intellect will never be capable of discovering God's plan. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. In other words, what the Bible is saying is that the shepherds could never have sat outside of Bethlehem that night on their own as as they were around the fire and say, you know what? You know what I think God's going to do tonight? I I think God tonight is going to be born down in a stable in Bethlehem. And and, and the king of the world is going to be laid for his very first night here on earth in in a manger. Maybe we need to go check it out. No, in a million years they would have never come up with that plan. And men today are never going to discover God's plan of salvation on their own. It has to be revealed to us. Now we can look at creation around us and say, well, there has to be a creator somewhere and he must be very powerful. We can look at the conscience of men and say, you know, there really has got to be a moral nature to the God we serve. But the essence of the gospel that God would come to earth, live a perfect life, lay that life down on Calvary's cross in our place, and rise again on the third day to show us that eternal life can be ours today. We, we could never have come up with that plan. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10 says, No, we speak the secret... Uh, no, we speak of God's secret wisdom... Uh, A wisdom that's been hidden and and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed this to us by his Spirit. How many of you like to see a good magic show? You, you ever been to a magic show? I, I, I love magic. One of, the, one of the tricks I was never able to figure it out, and I watched it over again. I saw it performed on stage. I, I watched it on TV. It's when they made somebody levitate. You know what I'm talking about? The, the, the magician would choose some very pretty lady out of the audience. I think it was a setup. <laughs> And he would bring her up on stage and and she would ever lie down on this board that was suspended between two chairs. And then he would take this cloth and he would put it over her and get everything ready. And and then when the time was right, he'd pull out one chair and then he'd pull out the other and she'd just float there in midair. I could never figure it out. I finally decided it must be satanic. I mean, there's no other explanation. And, and, and then they came up with a show on the Discovery Channel. Maybe you saw it called, How Do They Do That? And, and they began to show how some of these tricks work. And what, what you don't see is that that, that that board up there is not made of wood. It's, it's metal. It's strong. It's sturdy. And in the back, it's, it's attached to this bar <coughs> that goes down behind the stage and holds it up. And that bar has kind of a U in it so that that guy can take a a hula hoop and he can pass it all the way over and all the way back to show you that there's no strings attached. But all the time it's that bar that's holding everything up. And, and, And when they explain it, then you say, well, that's not satanic at all. That that That's simple. I, I mean, I could have done that. But on my own, I could never have figured it out. 
Now, the Bible says that man is not capable of discovering God's plan of salvation by his own reasoning. That it has to be revealed to us. And we speak, the Bible says, of God's secret wisdom revealed to us by his spirit. See, the, the, the first purpose that we have in life is to accept God's revelation. To humbly admit that, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I, I can never be good enough. I can never do enough good stuff to cover over my sins. And so I accept the truth. That there's only one God and that he alone should be worshipped. And I received the truth that, that, that only through that baby born in a manger so many years ago who came to die on a cross for my sins, do I have the hope of eternal life today? I accept the fact that you've revealed your truth to me in a book called the Bible. But till we begin with that premise, we will never know the ultimate purpose for our life. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as it actually is the word of God, which is a work in those who believe. So the first step to following God is to receive his word. To say this morning that, that the message that you're hearing today is not something somebody came up with years ago, but it's from God. The second thing I want you to notice about the shepherds is that they obeyed God's clear instruction. In Luke 2 verses 15 and 16 again, it says, The angels had left them and gone into heaven, and the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened that the Lord's told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. See, our purpose is not just to receive the revelation of God. It's to follow God's instruction. James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 22, Do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. It's not enough just to receive God's revelation. Our purpose is to be obedient to what God tells us. In Luke chapter 21, verses 28 to 31, Jesus told a little parable. He said that, that there was a man who had two sons. And he said to the first one, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. So the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he said, oh, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first one, they all answered. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. Did you ever think about if, if, if we were to go out on the street today, maybe over to Walmart and walk up to a few people going in and say, what is the purpose in life? What kind of answers will we get? Pro probably one of the, the, the largest answer, well, well, the purpose in life, I guess, is to be happy. But if our primary purpose in life is happiness, then invariably we'll always choose the easiest, the most pleasurable what seems the most advantageous to us. But you know what we find in life? That oftentimes the easiest, that immediate happiness, only leads to more misery later. It's kind of like if I were driving through town here one day, I'm in a hurry, I'm going a little faster than I should be, and, and, and you've all done this. No, maybe you haven't, but I have. You look into your rearview mirror and you see the blue lights. So you pull over to the side of the road and a policeman comes up to your window and he says, can I see your driver's license, your registration, your proof of insurance? And so you hand it to him. And, and he goes back to his car and, and he comes back a few more minute, minutes later and he hands your, you, your information back and then he says, I'm going to have to give you a ticket for speeding. 
And you say, that doesn't make me very happy. So after he pulls away, you wad the ticket up and you throw it in the trash can because that ticket didn't make you happy. And so about a month goes by and you're driving down the same road again. This time you're going the speed limit and you notice the blue lights behind you again. You wonder what he's doing. And he pulls you over and he said, well, I've got a bench warrant for your arrest because you didn't show up in traffic court. So he takes you in and he takes you before a, a judge and the judge says, why didn't you pay that speeding ticket he gave you? I mean, you were given a ticket. You were supposed to pay it. And you say, well, it just didn't make me happy, Your Honor. Now, now I can tell you that judge is not going to say, I understand completely. Everyone should be happy. Have a nice day. You know what he's going to say? He's going to say, well, would a week in jail make you happy? Because that's what I'm going to give you if you don't pay that fine right now. Now, we exist as creations of God to be obedient to God and not just to pursue our own agenda. Micah 6 verse 8 says, What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? A while back, I was talking to a friend of mine who was in the ministry too, and he told me uh, uh, the story of a couple who came to visit his office one day and, and they said, we've got something to tell you. And he said, well, what's that? And He had married them about 10 years earlier and they, he, they said, well, we're sorry to tell you this, but we're going to get a divorce. And so he said, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, no, it's not that anybody's cheated, it's... It's, it's not that anybody is, is, is really doing anything wrong. It's just that we're not happy anymore. The preacher said, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. But honestly, I, I think you ought to stick it out. Because God has not called you to be happy. He's called you to be obedient. After they left the office, they said they talked about what he'd said. God didn't call us to be happy. God called us to be obedient. And so they determined to continue to work on their marriage. And they were able, through some Christian literature and reading the Bible, to put things back together again. And finally, they came to a point that they were happy again. Psalms 1 verses 1 through 3 says, Blessed or happy is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree that's planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season whose leaf never withers. And whatever he does prospers. But, but if you're a farmer this morning or if you know anything about agriculture, you know that, that, that fruit doesn't just pop up overnight. It takes time. It takes growth. But invariably it comes. And When we as Christians are faced with decisions in our lives as to our marriage, our entertainment, our money, how to raise our children... Instead of just immediately doing what seems pleasurable, what makes us happy, our purpose needs to be to be obedient to God. See, the question we need to ask ourselves is not what will make me happy, but what does God want me to do? Because obedience in the end really brings fulfillment. See, I want you to see that the shepherds took time to worship this baby they found. They went to Bethlehem. They searched out the stable after stable until they came upon Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger just like they'd been told. And it says when they saw the baby, they worshipped him. Now worship is to show respect, to pay homage to, to, to ascribe devotion to. And when we come to church to worship God, our purpose here today is to acknowledge that God is Lord. That, that he's the sovereign and we are his people. 
When we worship, we express our thanks to him for his goodness and, and we, refer, or we affirm, reaffirm our, our allegiance to him as the Lord of our life. For the purpose of worship is not to inspire ourselves, but to exalt God. And that's why I think it's really sad. And, and don't tell me it doesn't happen because I know it does. When people leave church and they get in their car to go home and they say, you know, I really didn't get anything out of that. Really didn't hit me. And they critique the worship team, like the, the, the music, and they, they critique the speaker, like, well, you know, he's the entertainer. And we almost act like worship is for us. That it needs to meet my needs. It needs to entertain me. It needs to inspire me. It needs to teach me. I got to get something out of it. It's kind of like going to a birthday party. Or, or maybe a better example would be a 50th wedding anniversary. And you go to this anniversary and, and you tell, take a gift. And you tell the couple how much they've inspired you. And then you walk out the door and you say, you know, I really didn't get much out of that. Well, it wasn't for you. Instead, you ought to be satisfied if a couple says, you know, it was really great having you here today because it was for them that you went. You know, I think sometimes we forget that church, like Christmas, is about God, not about us. And so we don't say it doesn't do much for me. It's our job to do something for him. What would happen if the wise men had showed up or the shepherds to see the baby? And when they left, they said to themselves, you know, that didn't do much for me. Joseph really didn't say much. Did you notice that? Mary, she seemed kind of tired. Not, not, not really what I expected. I'll tell you what bothered me. It was when the baby started crying. I mean, that was so irritating. It just, just ruined the whole moment for me. I'll tell you what, the greatest thing the whole night was that angelic choir. I mean, wasn't that something? That old sky lit up and that choir. But you know what? It was a bit too bright. A little loud. No, the Bible says when they left Mary and Joseph... And the baby, they were jubilant because they had seen the Savior who is Christ the Lord. You see, the primary purpose of worship is to glorify God, to see that he is praised. So true worship should never be boring or ritualistic because the primary purpose of worship is to honor God, not inspire us. Reminds me of the little girl who, after Christmas, was asked, did you get everything you wanted? And she thought about it for a minute, and she said, no, but then again, it's not my birthday. <clears throat> See, worship, like Christmas, should be to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, not ourselves. But what I fear is that too many of us Picture worship as the worship team are the performers and, and God is the prompter and, 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 and the preacher is the entertainer and the congregation is here to be the audience. That's not true. When you come here on Sunday morning, you're the performers. The people you see up here on stage, we're the prompters and God is our audience. So let me ask you this. I wonder what he's getting out of our worship today. I sure hate God to walk away and say, you know, I didn't get anything out of that. They really didn't seem to come to worship me. But I also want you to see that after the shepherds saw the baby, they shared God's exciting message. In Luke 2, verses 17 and 18, it says, and when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. 
You, you know what I find in life sometimes? I, I find that when we're here on Sunday morning with each other, we're rather vocal about what we believe. But, but when we get outside the church, we get kind of silent. I, I, it's kind of like a man I heard who, who lent a friend $5,000 so that he could finish a facelift and some plastic surgery that he was having done to change his looks. The man never paid him back, and now he can't find him. <clears throat> you know, some Christians are like that. Well, we've been transformed by Christ. You really can't notice that out in the world. Because if you're vocal about Christianity today, if, you're, if you stand up for what the Bible teaches, then you're not going to be politically correct and there are going to be people who call you a Bible thumper. I mean, can you imagine? I, think with me. When, if the shepherds had left the stable that night after seeing Mary and Joseph and this baby who was the Savior of the world... And on the way back to the fields, they said to each other, you know, if, if we go out and tell people that we saw angels, and they told us about a baby that was born and, and laid in a manger who's the savior of the world, they're going to think we lost our mind. They're going to think we've had one too many. Maybe we ought to just keep this to ourselves. No, they were so convinced that they went out and told everyone. And it says all who heard them were amazed at what the shepherd says. So we need to understand that we exist for the purpose of disseminating the revelation of God to others. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, as Jesus was about to leave this world, he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Your job is to tell others. In Acts, the fourth chapter, when, when the biggest court in the land, the, the Sanhedrin, put Peter and John on trial for, for preaching about Jesus, they said, okay, we're going to let you go, but quit preaching about this Jesus. Verses 19 and 20, it says, Peter and John replied, judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight for us to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help but speak what we have seen and heard. You can't shut us up. See, if Jesus really came to dry on the cross for our sins, and we really believe that by accepting him, that he forgives all of our sins and one day we're going to live with him for all eternity. If we really believe that, honestly, how can we keep quiet about it? We're compelled to share it. When I was a little guy growing up in Sunday school, we used to sing this song, it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. They're singing in laughter since Jesus made me whole. Folks don't understand it, but I can't keep it quiet because it's bubbling, 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 bubbling day and night. Sharing the message of Jesus is, is like a fountain welling up inside us that we just can't suppress. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, probably one of the greatest seasons of the year to share our Christian testimony is Christmas. It's all about Jesus, and yet we live in a world that wants to ignore Jesus altogether. So they say, happy holidays, season's greetings. But we need to tell the truth. We need to tell them that the reason for the season is a baby born in Bethlehem that became your Savior. What, what an open door for us. Like the shepherds, we need to spread the good news. Like Peter and John, we need to say, we can't help but speak about what we've seen and heard. 
Hey, hey if, we don't, if we don't have the courage to talk about Jesus at Christmas time, then when will we? Remember, it's Jesus who tells us in Luke chapter 9, verse 26, if anyone's ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Listen, if somebody's offended this year because you tell them about Jesus Christ, that's their problem. (laughs) Because I'd rather be an offense to others than to be an offense to God. Last week I talked about a, a, an ecumenical greeting card that kind of went through all of the, the garbage of today. But, but, but I thought, you know, I need to kind of counterbalance that this week. So I went out and looked for a card, and I found one that said it all. On the cover, it just has the word Jesus. And then when you open it up, it says, It happened in a moment, but it changed the world forever. God's son became a helpless baby boy. From our sins he came to save us. With his matchless grace forgave us. He's our savior and our everlasting joy. Let me tell you something. That's a far cry from happy holidays. You see so many people think that Christianity exists for us. No. We exist to advance Christianity. Remember I told you back at the beginning of the sermon about that headhunter in Chicago, that, that chief executive who, who, who tried to put people at ease. But then he would lean across the desk and he, he would ask that question, what is the purpose of life? He said there was one man <coughs> that amazed me. He said without batting an eyelash, he said it's to go to heaven when I die and take as many people with me as I can. You see, we don't just exist to be happy or to be wealthy or to be famous. The the world outside might tell you that. But I told you at the beginning that I think we exist for just two words. To glorify God. That's all there is to it. Like the shepherds that says they return glorifying God. Our purpose needs to be to glorify God every day too. And we do that by receiving his revelation, by obeying his commands, by worshiping his son, and by telling everybody we know about the message of Jesus Christ. See, just as a secret servant agent is assigned to the president, and he exists for the purpose of enhancing and protecting the president, even to the point of laying down his own life, We exist for the purpose of exalting Jesus Christ and glorifying God even to the extent of sacrificing our lives. And the great thing is that when we really understand that purpose and fulfill it, we are fulfilled. Because that's our reason for being. That's the reason God created us. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 39, whoever finds this life will lose it. You got in the world, they might tell you what makes life worth living, but but in the end you lose it. But anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. That night in a stable in Bethlehem, the, the shepherds found something more valuable than gold. They found Jesus Christ who gave them lasting joy, a mysterious peace, and a spiritual meaning for their lives. And you know what? He wants to offer us the same thing today. If we would just believe the truth that they believed that night, when the angel finally stood before them and said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do you believe that? That God sent a Savior. 
God sent exactly what we needed. We could never pay the price for our sins. We could never be good enough. The Bible says one mistake is all it takes. And all those other good works you do in life, they're not worth anything. In fact, to God, they're like filthy rags. So God said, I need to send a Savior. So he picked his only son. Now let me tell you something. I've got five kids. And if it took the death of one of them to save you, it's tough for you. <clears throat> but God only had one. And he gave him up so that we could have eternal life. I can't think of any better gift than that. But you know, the really strange thing is that, that after all we know and after all we learned and after all he tells us in his word, there are people that just turn the gift away. They never accept it. But we want you to, and that's why we're offering this invitation this morning. Hi, I'm Gary Swick, and I'd like to thank you for listening to the message this morning at Paoli Christian Church. We hope that what you've heard has touched your heart and encouraged you in your walk with God. We would really like to hear from you if you have any spiritual needs that we might help you with. You can contact us by looking for us online at paolichristianchurch.org or by phone at 812-723-2664. Paoli Christian Church is located at 1700 West Hospital Road in Paoli, Indiana. Once more, thank you for listening and I hope that you'll listen again next Sunday as we worship God together at Paoli Christian Church.